Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Uh, hi guys. So, we are doing the Spanish Monarchs family tree today. Uh, Palayo to Felipe the Sixth. Useful charts. Preemptive like. Awesome channel. Original link to the video. Top of the description right below that. Link to the Discord. Click on it. Send you right over there. Love to have you. Hot Wars. I will do that as well. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm excited for this one. Because the Spanish Empire is one of those empires in Europe that I probably know least about, the least about right now. Um... And there, they were kind of their their peak was a bit before a lot of the history I've been learning about so far. If that makes sense, not to say I haven't gone into some 18th and 17th and uh, 16th century history, but just not as much. Let's go. My name's Connor. Hi. Hi. My name is Hi. Jack Rackham, and today I'm going to show you okay. the family tree of Spanish monarchs, starting all the way back with the Kingdom of Asturias, continuing through the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon, and going all the way through the unified Kingdom of... Sorry guys, I have to shut up. All the way back show you the family tree of Spanish monarchs, starting all the way back with the Kingdom of Asturias, continuing through the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon, and going all the way through the unified Kingdom of Spain, which of course still exists today. So in total, we'll be looking at almost 1300 years of history. I'll be using Matt's European Royal Family Tree West chart, which shows all of the various Spanish monarchs in red. Fantastic channel. For someone like me, it's it's a very, it's uh, the channel, I, I saw it and I saw it was very popular, but just seeing how it was about charts and stuff, um, which I don't, I learn better with like pictures. <laughs> I'm more of like a picture book guy, <laughs> but uh, the, the f fantastic, phenomenal videos and uh, one of my favorite channels for sure. Oh, he does Animal Kingdom stuff too. So, if you are familiar with this chart, you'll know that it has Charlemagne at the very top, which yes. makes sense because most of the various monarchies in Europe somehow connect back to him. But there's actually a second person at the top of this chart. Over on the far left, you'll also find Peter, Duke of Cantabria. Quick backstory, after the I just want to say, very impressive for Charlemagne to consolidate that much... I don't know if he envisioned kind of making sure his heirs were spread around Europe or whatnot, but... Find Peter, Duke of Cantabria. Quick backstory, after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, most of Hispania came under the control of the Visigoths, a barbarian group that later converted to Christianity. But then, in 711, Muslims. the Muslim Umayyad dynasty conquered the Visigoths and took over virtually all of the Iberian Peninsula. This resulted in a Impressive. revolt in the north. There, in less than a decade, a Visigothic nobleman named Pelagius managed to re-establish a small, independent Christian kingdom, which became known as the Kingdom of Asturias. Pelagius was followed by his son Favila, and then by his son-in-law, Alfonso I. And Alfonso was the son of Peter, Duke of Cantabria. So, Peter is the earliest verifiable Spanish ancestor of the later monarchs of Spain. You can see here that initially the kings of Asturias came from Alfonso I's branch, Eyes but out. then later things switched over to his brother Fruella's branch. It is from the Fruella branch that we eventually get a king named Alfonso the Great. Remember, at this point, most of the Iberian Peninsula was still under Muslim rule, currently in the form of the Emirate of Cordoba. The Kingdom of Asturias was just a tiny kingdom in the north. Well, during the reign of Alfonso the Great, the area controlled by Christians started to grow. Because of this, his son Fruella II moved his capital to the city of Leon, which is why it's around this point that the Kingdom of Asturias started to be called the Kingdom of Leon instead. The original name, Asturias, has not been forgotten though. Nowadays, the title Prince or Princess of Asturias is used for the heir apparent or heir presumptive of the Spanish throne. 
So it's like the Prince of Wales? Uh, kind of like the term Prince of Wales in the UK. Currently, I'm that learning. person is Leonor, eldest daughter of King Felipe VI. It is also around the time of Alfonso the Great that several other independent Christian kingdoms started to form in Spain, such as the Kingdom of Galicia and the Kingdom of Pamplona, later known as Navarre. But keep in mind that the borders were constantly changing at this point, and there was not only fighting between Muslims and Christians, but also between Christians and Christians. Generally speaking though, it can be said that Leon was the dominant Christian power up until around the year 1000. In fact, the kings of Leon sometimes even styled themselves as emperors. Around the year 1000 though, we get a king from Pamplona known as Sancho the Great from the House of Jimenez. He ended up conquering the county of Castile, which had been growing larger, and then the all-important city of Leon, where Bermudo III was ruling as king. As it happened, Bermudo III's sister Sancha was married to one of Sancho the Great's sons, so when Bermudo III died shortly thereafter, without any heirs, Leon conveniently passed to the now dominant Jimenez dynasty, mm. with Sancha's husband becoming Ferdinand I, aka Ferdinand the Great. It is around this point that the Christian area of Spain can be said to have consisted of four main kingdoms, Leon, Castile, Navarre, and Aragon. This is why, to this day, the coat of arms in Spain has four main parts. The castle represents Castile, the lion represents Leon, the red and yellow stripes represent Aragon. I don't know why, I just, I, I love the, the red and yellow stripe flags, or, uh, I don't know why. I don't know what it is. It's so simple, but, uh, I like it. And the chains represent Navarre. So basically, these four areas were divided amongst the sons of Sancho the Great. The eldest son, Garcia Sanchez, received Pamplona, aka Navarre. His second son, Ferdinand, as I've already mentioned, received Leon, but also Castile. And a third son, Ramiro, who was illegitimate, received Aragon. Thus, the House of Jimenez originally controlled all four kingdoms. Of the four kingdoms, the union of Castile and Leon would end up becoming the dominant one. In fact, Ferdinand the Great's son, Alfonso VI, ended up using the title Imperator Totius Hispaniae, Emperor of All Spain, being the first king to do so in official documents. He married a French princess and Hey there, okay, France. Thus, Charlemagne's blood entered into the Castilian line at this point. Next came the first reigning female monarch in Spanish history, Uraca? Empress Uraca. But before we go on, I should mention that Alfonso VI had another daughter, an illegitimate one, with his mistress, Princess Zaida of Sevilla, who is said by some to have been a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. That daughter then had an illegitimate descendant who married Edmund, Duke of York, over in England. Their descendants include, among many others, the current monarch of the United Kingdom, Queen Elizabeth II. So this is why it is sometimes said that the queen is a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. What? Although, keep in mind that some of the connections are up for debate. Okay. If you're interested in learning more about this, Matt's got an older video on the topic, which I'll link to in the description. Okay, returning to Spain, Empress Uraca married Raymond from the House of Burgundy. This House of Burgundy is the one from Italy, also known as the House of Ivrea, not to be confused with the French House of Burgundy, which ended up ruling in Portugal. Anyhow, because of that marriage, the reigning Spoiler. house in Castile and Leon changed at this point from the House of Jimenez to the House of Burgundy. Portugal is one of those things, kind of like uh, Wales, where uh, learning about, you know, English or British history, how Wales seem to be able to stay its own thing away from England for many centuries or at least decades or something. But Portugal is also, is like, how did Portugal not get conquered by Spain? It's, it's right next to it, much smaller. It, it, it's only between Spain and, and the ocean. Uh, You'll notice around this time there was an attempt to split Castile and Leon into two separate kingdoms, but eventually the two lines merged again, and from this point on, the kingdoms remained united. 
Meanwhile, over in Aragon, the House of Jimenez died out as well, being replaced with the House of Barcelona because of this marriage here. You'll notice that there was a lot of intermarriage between the two royal families of Castile and Aragon during this period, as well as several key marriages with other European powers such as France and England. There's also a connection to the European royal family tree north slash east version of this chart through Violant of Hungary. Whenever you see a white square on either the west or east charts, that means that person can also be found on the other chart. Oh, first time I've seen that, okay. Now let's zoom ahead to the 1350s, which is when we get a war known as the War of Two Peters. One of the Peters being Peter IV of Aragon. Sorry, okay, so Isabella and Ferdinand, that, that's the famous kind of two that you are kind of recognizable even if you don't know much Spanish history. As the War of Two Peters. One of the Peters being Peter IV of Aragon, and the other being Peter of Castile. Interestingly, there was also a third Peter nearby as well, King Pedro of Portugal. Anyway, a lot was happening in Europe at this time. First of all, England and France were in the middle of their Hundred Years' War, and both sides- King Alfonso V, what's that hat man? First of all, England and France were in the middle of their Hundred Years' War, and both sides were keen to find reliable allies. Second, it was also the time when Europe was being hit hard by the Black Death. So here's what happened. Peter of Castile was known to his supporters as Peter the Just, but to his enemies, of which he had many, he was known as Peter the Cruel. His illegitimate half-brother Henry decided to use this opportunity to try to take the throne for himself. He approached France and said, here's the deal. If you support me in stealing the throne from my brother, I'll help you with your war with the English. To which the French said, sure, sounds good. Deal. On top of this, Peter IV of Aragon joined in too, because if someone's going to take down the neighboring king, you might as well get in on the action too. Of course, England... Not hey guys, wa why watch Game of Thrones, okay, when there is an amazing Game of Thrones, when there is an amazing stuff in history, all right? Forget that, join me, and we're going to learn about history like it's a TV show, okay? Get, get in line. Take down the neighboring king, you might as well get in on the action too. Of course, England, not wanting Castile to become a French ally, supported Peter the Cruel. I mean, the just. In the end, Henry was victorious, and thus a new royal house was born. The House of Trastamara. The English weren't happy about this though, and one of their princes, John, Duke of Lancaster, who happened to be married to one of King Peter's daughters, actually decided to claim the Castilian throne for himself. He made an alliance with the Portuguese, which interestingly still stands to this very day as the longest continuous alliance in history, I've heard of that, and yeah. together they tried to launch an invasion. But he failed, and thus the House of Trastamara took root. If you're a regular viewer of this channel, you'll know that this is also the point in which the matrilineal House of Garcenda entered the royal lines of Europe. If you don't know what I'm referring to and are curious, you can check out the link in the description. As you can see, the House of Trastamara ended up ruling Aragon as well, once the male line descendants of Peter IV ran out. On top of this, Aragon eventually gained Navarre. So once again, the four main Christian kingdoms of Spain were ruled by the same family. To cap things off, Ferdinand II, hey! the king of Aragon and Navarre, married his second cousin once removed, oh, Isabella I, no. who was queen regnant of Castile and Leon. <laughs> With this, Spain finally united, although technically the various kingdoms kept their own separate laws until 1750. Hey, I guess second cousin, in terms of as far as royal ancestral marriages go, I guess second cousin, I, I should be like, okay, fine. These two joint rulers, known as the Catholic monarchs, are important for at least four reasons. First, it was during their reign that the Reconquista, the reclaiming of Spanish lands back from the Muslims, was finally completed. The last Muslim stronghold hey. to fall was the Emirate of Granada in 1492. The pomegranate on the bottom of the Spanish coat of arms symbolizes this final addition to the crown. Uh, by the way, if you're interested in... That'd be so cool. I would like... I would... Is he about to say if you're interested in... I would love... So, I love all the, the coats of arms of, of Europe are really cool and, and fascinating, but learning uh, through the useful charts videos that, like, everything on it has a meaning, which... 
should go without saying, and I'm an idiot for not assuming that, they're not just going to toss up random symbols. I'd like to go to the different coats of arms and just see like what stuff means on each of them. Learning more about Islamic Spain, I recommend checking out the series on Al-Andalus by al Muqaddima, which I've linked to in the description. Second, they are the monarchs who sponsored Christopher Columbus's famous journey to the New World. Third, they were the ones who were responsible for the Spanish Inquisition, which, of course, no one expected. No one expects. And for the expulsion of the Jews. Because of this, many Sephardic Jews, who had been an important part of Spanish society for centuries, ended up fleeing to the Ottoman Empire, where they were more welcomed. Fourth and finally, it was Ferdinand II who was responsible for conquering most of southern Italy for Aragon, and hence for Spain. Now, Ferdinand and Isabella had a son named John who was supposed to become king of all their territories after their deaths. But at age 19, he died, and his death ended up becoming very consequential for European history. This is because his death was... I was thinking about something else, I'm sorry. ...had a son named John, and had a son. So the Jews are more welcome in Muslim than in Christian. That makes... Religion is fascinating, because... We tend to look in like the you know the now and like which religions tend to be more um justified for for some sort of violence and learning through history it's just it seems like these sort of like rotate into like okay this is the religion that's really like fanatical and killing people and then like next century this is a religion and and Second, who was responsible for conquering most of southern Italy for Aragon, and hence for Spain. Now, Ferdinand and Isabella had a son named John, who was... Blah, 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 blah. Stop. Go ahead if you want. What did I... S and for the expulsion of the Jews. Because of this, okay. many Sephardic Jews, who had been an important part of Spanish society for centuries, ended up fleeing to the Ottoman Empire, where okay. they were more welcomed. All right. Fourth and finally, it was Ferdinand II who was responsible for conquering most of southern Italy for Aragon, and hence for Spain. Now, Ferdinand and Isabella had a son named John who was supposed to become king of all their territories after their deaths. But at what? age 19, he died, and his death ended up becoming very consequential for European Spanish history. Spanish succession? This is because his death was followed by the death of his older sister Isabella, who had married the King of Portugal, or Spanish meaning succession? that the crowns would therefore pass to his younger sister Joanna, who was married to Philip, the son of the Holy Roman Emperor. Philip actually died young as well, but not before having a bunch of children with Joanna, and thus the stage was set for one man to inherit all the various crowns of Spain, as well as the ultimate prize, the title of Holy Roman Emperor. That man was Charles V from the House of Habsburg, known in Spain as Charles I. He reigned for 40 years and controlled more territory in Europe than anyone had since Charlemagne. When he abdicated in 1556, though, he left his imperial title to his brother Ferdinand and his Spanish titles to his son Philip II. Note that Charles V had married a Portuguese princess. Because of this, Philip II eventually ended up inheriting- I feel like it's so much smarter to- I don't know why he abdicated exactly, but it seems that some monarchs let the power get to him and, and like, they-, they it seems like some don't plan ahead as much, whereas others really do, and even abdicate at some point, and making sure to lay out the framework for their descendants to take charge. Inheriting the throne of Portugal princess. Because of this, Philip II eventually ended up inheriting the throne of Portugal as well, thus creating the Iberian Union. And on top of all this, both Spain and Portugal had many overseas colonies by this point, so Philip II became the first truly global emperor in world history. I was about to say, why does Philip II look really familiar? Was he... Elizabeth of France? He was with... Elizabeth? Although technically he did not use such a bombastic title. Sure, we tend to use phrases like the Spanish Empire, but take note that the Spanish Empire was actually ruled by a king, not an emperor. But still, ever heard of a country called the Philippines? Well, it's named for this guy here.
Philip really? II married four times. He had a son named Charles with his first wife, and it was he who was expected to be Philip's heir. That's why when Philip married his second wife, Mary... That's why Philippines is spelt P-H-I-L-I-P-I... -I, I forget what I just said, nonsense. ...expected to be Philip's heir. That's why when Philip married his second wife, Mary, who happened to be the Queen of England, That's there why. was no thought of a union between England and Spain. As it happened, he never had any children with Mary, nor did he have any sons with his third wife, Elizabeth of France. That's why he was familiar to me, the, the Mary situation. But then, when his firstborn son Charles died at age 23, he had to marry for a fourth time Anne? in an effort to Anna? have another son. But this time, he married his sister's daughter, which is where the infamous Habsburg inbreeding begins. What? So, okay, ancestral relationships here in the uh, monarchical history of France, or of, of, of Europe. I'm sure it happened other places in the world, but for some reason, your sister's daughter it just seems even even too weird in this context okay that's just straight okay this is history all right just philip ii had a son with his niece and that Jesus son be Christ. became the next king of spain as philip the okay. third mature the third then married his first cousin once all right my my laughs are over <clears throat> Second had a son with his niece, and that son became the next king of Spain as Philip III. Philip III then married his first cousin once removed and had Philip IV, who then married his niece and had Charles II. So by the time we get to Charles II, the inbreeding had really taken its toll. Charles was supposedly very ill, and because of this, he was unable to produce an heir. This sparked the War of the Spanish Succession. That is, irony were made of strawberries. We'd all be drinking a lot of smoothies. So in order to keep the, th the, the, the throne in their family, they had a child that was impotent. That's ironic. One option was to have the Austrian branch of the Habsburgs split in two, with Joseph I becoming Holy Roman Emperor and his younger brother Charles becoming King of Spain. The other option was to continue through Charles II's aunt, Maria Theresa, who happened to be married to Louis XIV, King of France. The idea was to have Maria Theresa's grandson Philip become king. After more than a decade, the conflict finally came to an end with the French side winning and Philip becoming Philip V of Spain. Okay, I really want to learn about the, the 1700s, the 18th century, that I really, really want to learn. I also want to learn about, you know, in terms of more ancient history, I'd like to learn a bit more about uh, ancient Egypt a bit. And, um... Um... Oh my god. Oh, and uh, ancient Greece as well. But um, in terms of modern, more modern history, uh, I, I would like um, to learn about the 1700s. This is why, at this point, we get another change of house for the Spanish monarchy. From this point forward, the reigning house will be the House of Bourbon. But keep in mind that the Spanish Bourbons, including the current King of Spain, are also the direct descendants of the Spanish Habsburgs, just via a female line. So Philip V was followed by his son Ferdinand VI, and then by another son, Charles III. Charles III was then followed by his son, Charles IV. Note that around this time, two branches like of the George Spanish Washington. Bourbons split off. There was the House of Bourbon II Sicilies that went to reign over most of southern Italy until Italian unification, and the House of Bourbon Parma, who became the Dukes of Parma. It was during the reign of Charles III, Napoleon's son Ferdinand VII, that things became a bit complicated. Ferdinand VII did not have any sons, and according to the House of Bourbon, women were not allowed to inherit. However, at earlier times, Spain had in fact allowed women, so there was some controversy over which way things should go after Ferdinand VII died. 
One side supported his three-year-old daughter Isabella II, but another side supported Ferdinand's brother Carlos. Thus began the Carlist Wars, named after Carlos the Count of Molina. But in addition to the question of succession, the Carlist Wars were also about politics in a more broader sense. Those who supported Isabella II wanted a liberal constitutional monarchy, whereas the Carlists wanted absolutist monarchy. In the end, with the backing of France, the United Kingdom, and Portugal, the liberal side won. When she came of age, Isabella II married her first cousin Francis, who was a male line Bourbon. This ensured that the crown would continue to be held by the Bourbon family even though it had passed through a woman. However, the Carlists did not go away. There was later a second Carlist War, a third Carlist War, what? and in some ways the 20th century Spanish Civil War was sparked by Carlism as well. <laughs> in each case, however, the Carlists failed to obtain victory. As it turned out, Isabella II was succeeded by her son Alfonso XII, who was in turn succeeded by his son Alfonso XIII. But after 45 years on the throne, Alfonso XIII was deposed and Spain became a liberal republic. However, just a few years after this, Spain descended into a civil war fought between a left-wing coalition and a right-wing coalition. The right-wing side ended up being led by a man named Francisco Franco, who emerged victorious and who went on to rule Spain as a dictator for the next 36 years. However, before Franco died, he named one of Alfonso XIII's grandsons as his heir, and thus in 1975, after the death of Franco, Spain's monarchy was restored, with Juan Carlos I becoming king. Juan Carlos reigned until 2014, when he abdicated in favor of his son Felipe VI, who is the current king of Spain. Hmm. As we mentioned in our Who Would Be King of France video though, there is actually a more senior line. King Felipe's grandfather had an older brother named Jaime, who gave up his rights to the throne because he was deaf. However, during Franco's reign, he rescinded that renunciation, and today, he has a grandson named Luis Alfonso, whom some see as both the rightful king of Spain, as well as the rightful king of France. But I mean, you abdicated, or you can't just rescind it, man. Let's but I don't think you'll be seeing any legitimist uprisings in Spain anytime soon. Fifth time, let's if go. anything, Spain is more likely to simply give up its monarchy altogether. However, if the monarchy does continue into the future, the next monarch will likely be Felipe VI's eldest daughter, Leonor, currently 15 years old. Note that she has the title heir presumptive instead of heir apparent, because Spain still goes by male preference primogeniture, and technically, if King Felipe son. were to have a son, that son would outrank her in the line of succession. It doesn't look like that will happen though, and thus if the monarchy continues and Leonor becomes queen, upon her death, the reign of the patrilineal House of Bourbon will come to an end. Unless, of course, she marries a distant cousin. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. So Tradition. that was a look at the monarchs of Spain, all the way from the Kingdom of Asturias to Felipe VI. Again, if you'd like to buy a copy of the poster, you can head over to our website, usefulcharts.com. Do it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for making. Amazing channel. Fantastic. Phenomenal. Loved it. And I'd really like to get into the 1700s. I think I'm going to watch the uh, COD Wars, though, first. See you next time, guys. Hope you're all doing well. Chin up. Emotions are fickle. You'll be good soon, if not. See you.